Okay, so it's not going to happen. We're going to move forward. So if you're here to learn about Playboy um, and their recent and ongoing um, gamified experience called Miss Social, you're in the right place. If you are not interested in Playboy, it's time to go. Um, I'm Molly Kittle. I work for a company called Bunchball. And Bunchball started in 2005 as a social gaming company. And so our, our founder and now chief product officer was coming to this conference um, talking about social games back then. And the company evolved. And we're here today talking about gamification. It's, it's pretty amazing the journey that's happened between then and now. Um, if, I, if I think about myself um, and where I was four years ago, um, I was working for a company that was selling downloadable games. We had a catalog of games, both casual and core, and so I was going to major media companies and, and asking them to engage their consumers, their users, their visitors more deeply by siphoning them off into a game channel. And then I ran into Rajat and learned what Bunchball was doing, and I was sold. Um, instead of directing traffic into an auxiliary area, taking people away from the core experience, away from the core content of the site, they were actually using the things that make games fun and enticing to drive participation and engagement with that core content. And so I left the world of casual and core games and came to work for Bunchball about four years ago. And at that time, if you told me I'd be standing here and that this whole experience would be, have a name, that it would be called gamification, I don't think I would have believed you. Um, at that point in time, we were talking about game mechanics. But what we were do is, doing is we were gamifying sites. Um, we were adding those game dynamics, those game mechanics, into the website experience, into applications, layering them inside of the core experience to make things more compelling, fun, dynamic, and engaging just to drive participation, to drive either business value or social value. Um, and I know we've heard a lot about gamification over the last couple of days, and there are a number of different reasons why people would want to gamify their experience. Um, Tim made a really good comment in his, um, in his presentation earlier, Tim Chang. He, he said that we'll know if gamification, or the, the ultimate test of gamification success will be in customer renewal. And that made me super excited to hear because when someone as forward thinking and as visionary as Tim realizes that the metric for success is renewal, um, Bunchball can only agree. We're looking at an incredible roster of clients who have been with us for multiple renewals over years um, and their, their relationship with us only continues to grow. So what do I do there? I work with these guys to help them understand how to use gamification to drive engagement within their site experience. So uh, sites like USA Network, who spoke earlier today, Bravo, um, Comcast, Access Hollywood, some, some NBC properties, um, then brands like Nestle, um, uh, work uh, environments where you're trying to increase employee motivation, like places like Live Ops, um, Hope Lab, where you're looking at healthy behaviors and encouraging um, kids to exercise more and using gamification to drive that type of healthy behavior. Um, and then Playboy, which is what we're here to talk about today. So brands that are targeting a younger demographic like Hasbro, all the way to brands like Playboy, who are also looking to target a younger demographic and a more social demographic. So in 2010, uh, Playboy realized that their audience was skewing older. And so they were selling subscriptions, but if they were able to broaden the age range of Playboy subscribers into the younger demographic, they would be able to increase their subscription sales substantially. And so in order to achieve that, they decided to use gamification. So there were a number of different um, ways they could have moved forward. Um, there were a number of different marketing tools and techniques at their disposal. And the reason they chose to gamify an experience was that they wanted to attract, engage, grow, and monetize. Those were their, their core, um, core goals. And they were seeing that other people, other marketers in the space, who had similar goals, were seeing incredible success. 40% um, increase in unique users, 30% of vi visitors that would come and then register as a result of interacting with a gamified experience. 100% increase in page views, 85% increase in time on site, um, incredible uplift in Facebook participation, ad revenue, product sales, the list goes on. Um, and so that's why they chose gamification. It wasn't that 
it was just a compelling idea. It wasn't just that they could create a fun experience. It was that they had a business objective, and they knew that there was a tool set that when applied correctly, and it's super exciting to hear uh, Keith and others today talk about the need for analytics, for, um, for layering in gamification components in a very intelligent and um, effective way that it's not about, finally, you know, we had a lot of small companies come into the space recently, and, and I think that um, there was a, it took a minute for everyone to realize that it has to be a conscious application of game mechanics and game principles. It has to be done thoughtfully and carefully and with the user experience at the forefront. Um, and so that's super exciting. And that's how you get results like this. You don't get results like this by throwing up a leaderboard. So you also have to have really good content, and Playboy has a lot of it. Um, they also knew that they could create additional content if they were to uh, create an experience that would foster the desire for users to share and to generate their own content. You need community, and so they realized they had the ability to harness a, an already existing community on Facebook. They had very clear business goals, which we just talked about, um, and they had a very clear understanding of their participants, both the uh, women who were going to be participating in the Miss Social experience and the, uh, the people who were going to be voting for them, the audience, let's call them. So they created this grassroots social model search for uh, young women to come and to rally their, their fans around them so that they would be voted Miss Social. And this is a recurring program. Every month, a new Miss Social is voted uh, into winnership, if that's a word. And she gets a, a photo shoot in Playboy. And so you have a very clear, finite uh, contest of sorts. And underneath that contest are layered all these different activities that, that drive the monetization, the uh, growing of the user base. Uh, all those, those, those KPIs that we talked about earlier are fed by um, the ways that people earn points. So people can uh, vote, and by voting, they're spending their votes. They can uh, interact with a hot or not application that we'll talk about in a minute, and that's how they earn more votes. They also earn more votes um, by uh, inviting friends, by posting shout outs, um, and some other social interaction here within this Miss Social application. And again, the goal is to increase subscribers. So it's essential if you're going to be creating any type of gamified experience, and Tim talked about this earlier as well, is how do you onboard people? How do you make sure that the experience is very clear and, how, and explicit, and that there are, there are rules that are easily understood so that people can participate right away? And Playboy did a great job of that. Um, there's a clear call to action to get votes, to spread the word, um, and to potentially buy votes if your activity within the experience isn't garnering you enough. So you're giving your participants very clear objectives to work toward. Fostering competition is essential in any competition, um, but especially here where we have a finite period of time, we have a, a rabid fan base, and then we have contestants. So how do you surface the progress that these contestants are making and, in, and encourage them to compete more? Um, and so you can see here a very standard leaderboard um, that is featuring the top performing contestants. So uh, because this was such a competitive environment and because there was a finite end game, using leaderboards here makes a lot of sense. And, and there is a lot of debate about whether when are leaderboards relevant and when aren't they. Um, this is a good example of when the, the time frame and the participant activity is all centered around competition and so leaderboards are effective. Badges and trophies introduced into the environment so that uh, there's an aspirational motivator. People have clear uh, goals to work toward. I, there's, a, there's a way that I can see the progress that I'm making over time, and I'm achieving, um, I'm achieving I guess what the word would be, uh, status symbols that I can share, um, and my votees or voters um, can see the progress I'm making as well. Using an appointment dynamic, this is a very simple mechanic that they've used very well in this program. You can see here there's a vote daily for five days badge. Um, it's a reward that also um, enables me to accrue additional votes. So if I come back every day for five days, I know that I'll get this special bonus and we'll be able to vote 
additionally for my, uh, my contestant of choice. Levels here are used in a very simple, strategic, and thoughtful way. You can see here that in the lower levels are, are intended to be the top of the funnel to move the contestant into um, the, the cycle of earning and, and, um, and moving up in the competition, but the higher levels, 250,000 uh, votes, move you into diamond and they get you into the semifinals. Um, some of the lower levels get you access to special placement inside the application or the widget, um, so that there's a, the ability for you to strive to get to the next level as you move through your arc of participation toward hopefully winning the monthly contest. Here we have Katrina Waller's uh, profile, and we can see that Katrina is um, in the sugar division, so there's the sugar and the spice division, depending on how you want to compete. Um, and you can see underneath her profile photo is a really clear call to action to vote. That's the, the primary driver for this competition. And so you can see, I can, I can click one of these voting increments. These increments are set up specifically so that I'm uh, voting, voting in buckets of votes rather than uh, incrementally. When people are given too many choices, um, they tend to get overwhelmed, so keeping it simple. And then the, uh, they've, uh, the founder of Wendy's often said, I only sell triple cheeseburgers to sell more double cheeseburgers. They're also seeing that more people are voting in the 500 point range um, because it's a middle ground that seems accessible and achievable. And once I've placed my vote for Katrina, I'm invested in her success. I have a sense of affinity with her. I'm obligated to vote more. And so um, this, this voting mechanic here with all these different layered components is really helping me as a voter to become attached to my contestant and to stay involved in the program. I talked earlier about a hot or not application. Um, one of the things we've talked about for a long time, and, and gamification is, has shown promise, Jesse Redness from, from USA talked about this earlier, is the ability to tie multiple experiences together. Um, his, ex his examples were around uh, second screen, interacting with your devices while you're watching television, having mobile apps, things like that. Um, here we're talking about two different experiences within Facebook that have been tied together using the um, the mechanic of votes. So I can earn votes not only for interacting with the application itself, but also for playing this game, which takes two different uh, contestants, pits them against each other, and I vote um, for which one I think is hotter than my vote is compared to other people in the experience, and I see if I uh, picked in line with the rest of the group. So um, again, we're, we're creating different ways to tie in multiple experiences into one gamified um, experience. The idea that this is a social application, that it's all about virality. Um, you can see here, this is the Playboy Miss Social Wall, constantly surfacing reminders, giving shout outs to not only contestants, but for the people who are voting for them, really rallying people around this contest, across this competition. That same kind of uh, posting and, and activity happens on individual contestants' walls. So here is Zoe Jones. Um, she's actually, I think, uh, surprised that she's, uh, that she's made it so far in the, um, in the voting. She was probably uh, submitted by a friend, um, and actually her, her voting was, uh, was surprisingly pushing her into semifinals, and she's calling, um, calling out to her supporters to vote for her again and again to increase her, her standing and her chance of winning. Here you can see a voters um, wall, and so you can see here that updates are posted to remind me to vote, to rally uh, friends and family, uh, to, in, to uh, participate more deeply and more frequently in the voting process. So we had a lot of interest on Facebook and, and that interest and that competition and that excitement grew and pushed the experience out into third party and private sites. So what you can see here, Breeze Tees, Breeze is actually asking her followers to donate, uh, her fans to donate so that she can actually buy more votes for herself in the contest. So this is something that Playboy didn't anticipate, but ended up being a huge viral driver, both uh, within Facebook and then outside on these third party sites as well. 
The thing that, that I think Playboy likes, uh, one of the things that they like the most about this is it's repeatable. So we've heard other folks today talk about the demand for resources and how um, it's important that things be uh, low maintenance and not require a lot of heavy lifting. This entire engagement is repeatable on a monthly basis. On the first of the month, it starts over and repeats in the same fashion as it did the month before. So these time-limited contests not only give Playboy the ability to know that something else will be happening in the next month, but they give contestants another chance to try. And so it, it lets them understand that there's always going to be a chance for them to win. Um, and that, that this isn't a one and done type of, um, type of engagement. So the initial results here, we talked earlier about attracting, growing, engaging, and monetizing in the first four months. Uh, their active user base grew from zero to 80,000. They engaged 85% um, uh, re-engagement rate, so of the people who came, 85% came back. And then the monetization, so 60% improvement in revenues from one month to the next. So their goal of increasing subscriptions did pay off during these, these initial months of the program. And that, that performance has also been sustained. Um, Miss Social June was just announced, and we're currently in the running for July. Um, when I look at their next steps as an organization and, and how they can use gamification, um, I talked about tying in specific applications, extending to mobile, um, and tying in the actual Playboy.com site as well. Um, these are areas they can move. But all of our customers are realizing the value of tying gamification into their traditional marketing calendar. And I think that's what becomes compelling. So um, if if Hef is tweeting and you see an increase of X percent on the days where he t tweets of activity within the site, how do you leverage that and tie that into the program? So not only are we uh, looking at the gamification components, the, the rate of re-engagement, the, the activity rates, but then we're also tying in marketing calendars and external third-party data sources to tell a complete story about our marketing initiatives as a whole. And I think that's really where gamification has the most bang for its buck. And that's it. I think uh, a few questions are all that's separating you from some cocktails. Going once. The man in the brown shirt. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, that's loud. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about having a, a product like this that's, you specifically say it aims to increase young subscribers, but I've talked to some people here when I mentioned going to this panel that they're part of uh, online portals and said that they'd been approached by uh, Playboy about putting out product and they had to decline because of their young uh, user bases. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Facebook is also designed in a way where people can disguise their age and potentially access this uh, content, no matter what age they are, they're not even an age gate or anything. So I was just curious how you deal with the issue of skewing too young, potentially, yes. with this platform. So that's, that's a really good question. I think that's probably more of a question for Playboy. Um, Bunchball provides uh, a platform, a technology platform that they use to create this. So I'm sure there was a lot of legal uh, dialogue when they were deciding what this program would look like. Um, we make best practice recommendations about how gamification can be most successful, but then in terms of compliance and regulations and legal, um, we try to stay out of that and not muddy the waters. So, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I'm not sure how they're handling uh, age gating. Um, the there's no nudity, if that's, if that's one just data point within this program, so that may be one way they're mitigating any kind of um, issue around age. Um, yeah. Anybody else actually have an answer to that? I would love to know. If anybody else is doing things with age sensitivity on Facebook and wants to give their two cents, that's actually a very interesting topic. Hi. 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 I just had a quick question. Um, in addition to the buying votes, is there any other way today we're monetizing that whole Miss Social site? 
So buying votes is where they're monetizing it directly, but then the, the actual winner gets a spread in Playboy, and so they're driving people who were voters in the contest who were following that, that uh, Miss Social contestant to actually become subscribers. So there's a kind of a, a funnel there toward purchase and subscription with the magazine tie-in. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, one question, how are you uh, uh, bringing people from different social networks rather than just relying on Facebook alone? How do you see the expanding social networks coming in? And then um, an answer to your question, a lot of people are using multiple identity providers in addition to Facebook to identify themselves into games when there's e-commerce going on or you know, you're buying wine or advertising wine and that sort of thing so that you're using an identity that's also associated with a payment because most children don't have credit cards, that sort of thing. So if you yeah. use your PayPal ID to sign in, we know that you're an adult. So that's uh, one way is using multiple social identities. But how do you guys leverage multiple social identities? So Bunchball actually doesn't handle registration. We seamlessly integrate with whatever existing registration exists with our partners. So there's, there's not a single sign-on or an integration piece there. So whatever rules and, and processes they have in place and gates they have in place um, within their existing registration system, we just plug into. Um, so it's not something that we actually as an organization have to deal with, luckily. And for just the different types of partners we have from Hasbro to ABC Family all the way to Playboy, everybody has a gamut of ways that they personally and legally deal with their own, uh, their own legal, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. Enjoy your night. <laughs>